And again, please just note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online uh, shortly afterwards. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria Hawk, and I'm the Shorebird Data Quality Manager for the Shorebird Program at Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. First off, thank you to each surveyor here for your interest in monitoring shorebirds and seabirds. Florida's extensive shorebird monitoring program is only possible because of the de dedication of people like you. Your monitoring effort helps us locate nests and chicks so we can protect them, identify threats so that we can manage them, and detect trends in populations so we can better track focal species. Once again, on behalf of all shorebirds and seabirds that nest in Florida, thank you so much for your participation. We have two main goals to cover today. Learn how to monitor shorebirds and seabirds using our standardized protocol, the breeding bird protocol for Florida's seabirds and shorebirds. I will be shortening that to the BBP or the protocol during this presentation. And we will also learn how to enter monitoring data into the Florida Shorebird Database, which I'll refer to as the FSD or the database for short. The FSD is our online database where you will be entering the data you collect. It is the repository that tracks nesting shorebirds and seabird data in Florida. Before you start monitoring and before we even discuss how to monitor, I want to remind you all that it is important to connect with your local Florida Shorebird Alliance partnership. For those new to shorebird monitoring, the Florida Shorebird Alliance, abbreviated as SFSA, is the statewide network of local partnerships committed to advancing shorebird and seabird conservation here in Florida. Your local partnership coordinators can help direct you to areas that need additional monitors. Some, loca some locations may already have adequate coverage. They can also help you connect with other monitors that you can shadow as you hone your shorebird monitoring skills and point you to important local resources. If you are unsure what partnership you are in or who to contact, you can visit the FSA's website and check out the partnership tab to explore the different partnership pages and find contact information for each partnership coordinator. You can also contact the Florida Shorebird Alliance coordinator, Florencia Morales at shorebird at myfwc.com. The FSD and the FSA websites are two great resources to visit for additional training materials, identification guides, annual reports, and video tutorials, including in the future, a copy of this webinar. The Breeding Bird Protocol provides standardized methods for data collection. When data is collected the same way across the whole state, we can track population trends and statuses and use the data to inform management decisions locally and statewide. A link to the protocol was emailed to you prior to the webinar and can also be found on the FSD website under the resources tab. Feel free to have a copy open as we continue. So what are we monitoring? What data are we collecting? The BBP provides instruction on how to monitor shorebird and seabird breeding populations. So these are counts of adult breeding birds nesting, chick rearing, and staging locations, nesting outcomes, so whether or not a nest successfully hatched, as well as any threats or disturbances that may be present in the habitat. These could be predation pressures, anthropogenic causes, or anything else that's going to threaten successful nesting. Seabirds and shorebirds are two biologically distinct groups of birds that nest on the beach and can be found along our coastlines and in some inland areas. For our purposes, the most important difference between seabirds and shorebirds are their nesting strategies. Seabirds nest together in groups called colonies. They bank on safety in numbers. A single colony will typically be comprised of multiple breeding pairs and contain one or more seabird species nesting together. The size of a colony will vary depending on species, location, and habitat composition. Because they nest in groups, colonies tend to be obvious. The adults are very loud and will even defend their colony by dive bombing intruders. Their chicks tend to remain within or close to the colony as they are dependent on their parents for food. 
Even after becoming flight capable, seabird young tend to hang out near colonies until the nesting season ends and adults disperse. In contrast, shorebirds are solitary nesters. A pair of shorebirds will typically choose to nest away from other shorebirds and rely on camouflage for safety. Due to their secretive nesting behavior, shorebird nests are more difficult to locate. Often the best way to find these cryptic nests is to patiently observe adults' behavior, which can take a bit of practice. Shorebird chicks are precocial, they are highly mobile, and are out of the nest within hours of hatching and may have already moved miles away from their natal nest. There are, of course, exceptions. Some shorebirds choose to nest in seabird colonies, and sometimes seabirds will nest individually. While seabirds and shorebirds are two distinct groups of birds, we sometimes refer to both groups collectively as shorebirds. For example, in the name of our database, the Florida Shorebird Database. There are 20 species of seabirds and shorebirds that nest throughout Florida. Not all these species nest statewide. For example, three of these species, the masked booby, the brown knotty, and the magnificent frigate bird only nest in the dry tortugas. It is unlikely that you will observe all these birds nesting where you are surveying, but we still ask that you pay attention for all species listed here. You never know when birds will try something new and unusual. They like to keep us on our toes sometimes. Uh, focus your efforts specifically on monitoring the 12 species in bold as seen on the slide. These are the species you are most likely to see if you conduct coastal route surveys and include species that are state threatened. So those species listed in bold and that you will most likely see when surveying are black skimmers, brown noddies, Caspian tern, gall billed tern, laughing gall, least tern, roseate tern, royal tern, sandwich tern, American oyster catcher, snowy plover, and of course, Wilson's plover. If you'd like to learn more about state threatened species and species action plans in the state of Florida, you can go to myfwc.com. Pictured on this slide are four of Florida's state listed breeding shorebirds. Clockwise from the top left, we have the American oyster catcher, the snowy plover, the black skimmer, and the least tern. Shorebird breeding season typically starts in March and goes through the end of August, but depending on species, weather, or where you survey in the state, you may see birds on nest as early as February or are still tending to unfledged young as late as October. The breeding bird protocol design designates six count windows, which are week-long survey windows from March to August. The count window dates are the same each year, and if you have surveyed with us before or have already read the protocol, you know that next Monday is the start of our first count window. At a minimum, we ask FSA partners, that's all of you guys, to commit to surveying during each count window. Surveying during these monthly count windows provides us with a statewide snapshot of breeding activity and limits the chance of double counting birds moving between areas in the state. We recommend surveying weekly once nests are observed where you are surveying. Weekly surveys provide a better estimate of peak counts and increase our understanding of nest outcomes and causes of nest failure. For example, let's say I am out surveying during the mate count window and I find an active nest. The next time I survey is during the June count window and I find that nest is no longer present. There is not enough evidence to determine what happened to the nest. It could have hatched and the chicks moved out of the area, or it could have been predated and the adults abandoned the site. If I had checked the nest weekly, I might have a better chance of determining the outcome of the nest because signs of what happened, such as tracks or broken eggshells, could still be present. There are a handful of key concepts that you'll need to understand before you start surveying. These are defined in the breeding bird protocol on pages three and four. We will discuss each concept first and then put them together for a theoretical survey trip and what that might look like. We'll go into more detail about what data is collected for each when discussing data sheets. A route is the path that you survey in search of breeding birds. 
Routes have designated start and endpoints and should be short enough to survey in a single outing. In the database, routes are represented as a line accompanied by a purple diamond as pictured on the map. Most routes will be land-based, typically covering beaches, but some breeding habitat can only be surveyed by boat, so you will see some water-based routes as well. There are likely already designated routes in your area. Using the same route every time you survey an area helps us better understand how the birds are using the habitat and how you can use and how that use changes during the breeding season and over years. Remember to connect with your local partnership to find out which routes are available to survey. When you survey a route, you're conducting a route survey. A route survey is each individual time that you visit a route to look for breeding birds and ideally covers the entire route from start to the end point. Route surveys should occur at least monthly during each of the count windows and then weekly if possible once nests are observed. A site is the physical location of where birds are nesting. Remember that seabirds and shorebirds have different nesting strategies and this is reflected in how we collect data. Shorebirds typically nest individually, so each shorebird nest is considered a site. Seabirds typically nest together in colonies, so each individual colony is considered a site. Like routes, sites are geographical locations. In our database, solitary shorebird nest sites are represented by a yellow diamond, and seabird colonies are represented by a blue diamond. Because seabird colonies cover an area as opposed to a single point like a solitary nest, the database also uses green polygons to represent the colony footprint as is pictured on this image on the slide. A site visit is when you check on a site, either a colony or a solitary nest. Site visits to a site should occur on every route survey from the time a nest site is discovered until the birds are no longer actively using the nest or colony. For solitary nests, this means that the breeding pair are no longer actively tending to the nest. For colonies, this means that all chicks and breeding adults have left the colony. A roving chick observation is the physical location where shorebird chicks are observed outside of the nest. We mentioned earlier that shorebird chicks are precocial and leave the nest shortly after hatching. A staging young observation is the physical location where flight capable seabird chicks are observed away from a colony. Seabird young are dependent on their parents for food even after they fledge. They rarely stray from the colony before fledging. Like routes and sites, these observations are geographical locations, but unlike routes and sites, these, survey, these locations are transient, representing where chicks were observed at the time of the survey. So they are not considered sites and thus do not have site visits. In the database, both roving chicks and staging young observations are represented as yellow circles, as you can see on the map. We did skip forward a little bit in the protocol. Roving chick and staging young are mentioned throughout the protocol, which is why I bring them up now, but they are specifically addressed on page 14 and 15 of the protocol. Let's pull all these concepts together and walk through what a potential route survey may look like. Choose a route that you would like to survey and that meets the needs of your local partnership. Then visit the route during a monthly count window or more frequently if you are able to, especially if there is nesting. Next, you will conduct a route survey. Start at the beginning of the route, the start point. As you survey the route, you see and hear a group of black skimmers and least turns on the beach. You stop to observe them and see that both species are nesting together. This is a mixed species colony site. You'll collect data for the site since it's the first time you documented the colony here, and you will also conduct a site visit. We'll cover both the site visit and collecting data on the site itself when we get to the data sheets. If you had documented this colony on a previous route survey, you would only need to conduct a site visit. After collecting the appropriate data, you continue on your survey. You observe a Wilson's plover incubating eggs further down the beach. This is a solitary site. Again, you collect data for the location of the site and then conduct a site visit. 
A, li a little further down the route, you observe a young killed deer with its parents foraging along the shoreline. This is a roving chick observation. You collect data for this observation and then continue surveying. Next, when nearing the end point of the route, you observe a group of black skimmer, flight-capable young being fed by their parents. They are well away from the colony site, so you report this as a staging young observation. You collect data for this observation and continue on to the end point of the route. The route survey ends at the route end point. Sometimes you may conduct a route survey and not see any sites or chicks or staging young. You may not see any breeding adults or chicks at all. This is still important information to document and is sometimes referred to as zero data. It's important data because it tells us where birds are not breeding. Let's go over some basic monitoring etiquette. There are a few things to keep in mind while surveying to keep both you and the birds safe. You're going to want to avoid disturbing the birds as much as possible. If birds are changing their behavior in response to you, such as giving a broken wing display, alarm calling, flushing, dive bombing, et cetera, then you're a little too close to their nests or chicks and you're gonna to wanna to back up. You want to give the birds the space they need to properly care for their nests and chicks. Also be aware of any potential predators. Flushing birds from their nest or chicks when predators are nearby could result in predation. Also, do not enter posted areas. These are areas that have keep out or do not enter signs or symbolic fencing. You need a permit from FWC, so the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to access these areas. If you see a nest or colony that is not posted, it is likely the land manager doesn't know about it. Alert landowners and managers about any new sites you find so they can post the area to keep people from disturbing the birds. Not sure who the land manager or landowner is? Contact FWC staff. You can get in touch with your regional shorebird biologist and they are a great resource uh, to help with these sorts of things. You can find their contact information on the FSD website underneath the help tab. We can break down monitoring ground nesting shorebirds and seabirds into three basic steps. Conduct a route survey, document any nests, colonies, and chicks or young observed on your route, and enter all this data into our online database at www.floridashorebirddatabase.org. To aid in data collection, we provide four data sheets, which we are going to go over today. And these data sheets are designed to collect data based on the standardized methods outlined in the Breeding Bird Protocol and can be found on the FSD's website under the Resources tab. The route form will be filled out under step one. The other three forms are all used in step two. Side note here for those of you that will be surveying in partnership with local, state, or other federal agencies, our land managers may have uh, their own data sheets or ask you to collect additional information. So what you use in the field may not look exactly like what we're going over today, but these are available uh, kind of as a blueprint for what data you'd like to collect. So let's start with step one, conduct a route survey. Every time you conduct a route survey, you will complete a route form. Even if you were not able to finish surveying the entire route or you do not observe any breeding birds, chicks, or young. Remember, zero data is important too. When filling out a route form, you will record the following, the names of the name of the route, the names of those observers that participated in the route survey. These should be the people who help collect data, not just people tagging along for fun. So if they're counting birds, count them as observers. If they're just there for fun, you don't need to document them on this form. You also need to record the date and the start and end time of the survey. For those of you that will be surveying uh, in the panhandle, there is two time zones up there in the panhandle. So record your time based on the local time of the area that you are, sur are surveying. How you also need to collect um, how you surveyed the route, as in what mode of transportation did you use to conduct your survey? Did you walk, use an ATV, a boat? 
You do not need to record how you access the route, just the mode you use to conduct the survey. So for example, if I am going out and surveying an island, I may need to take a boat to that island and then get off and walk around the island to do my survey. If I do that, I only need to report walking as my mode of survey. If I were to be counting birds from my boat and then also getting off the boat and walking around to survey, I would count both the boat and walking as my survey mode. Next, you'll also need to record how much of the route did you survey. The goal is always to do an entire route survey, but sometimes you may only be able to conduct a partial route survey. This means that you are only able to survey a section or portion of the route. You may not be able to survey the route in its entirety every time due to storms or time constraints, uh, tides or other causes uh, may cause you to have to cut a short bleh, survey short. It's a bit of a tongue twister. You also need to document additional breeding adults that you observe on route, and we'll get to those more in a second. And lastly, comments. Use the comment space to record any unusual observations that you might encounter. Birds like to do interesting, unusual things, and sometimes having those comments helps us understand the data a bit better. So some examples, uh, you could record non-breeding birds there or banded birds. To help keep you organized, there's also an optional site checklist. You can use this space to keep track of what known sites are on your route and if you visit them during the survey. We ask you to collect additional breeding adult counts for three focal shorebird species. This is the American oyster catcher, pictured top, the snowy plover, pictured middle, and Wilson's plover, pictured on the bottom. Big picture, what we want to know is how many adults for these three species are breeding on each route that you survey. And we can get that count by knowing the numbers of adults at nests, adults with chicks, and any additional adults breeding on route. So those additional uh, adults breeding on route are gonna come from birds that are likely to have nested this season, birds that, have, that currently have nests or chicks on route, but were not observed with them, and birds that had nests or chicks that in that nest or chick has already failed this season. So additional breeding adults are defined in the breeding bird protocol on page seven. Um, we added more detail to clarify the language surrounding our definition of that last year. So if you haven't surveyed with us before or haven't surveyed with us in a few years, be sure to read over that um, for more additional information. Not all adult shorebirds you observe on your route will be counted as additional breeding adults. The additional breeding adult count is not meant to be a count of every bird seen on your route, just those who are actually breeding on route but were not observed with their nest or chicks. Birds that are excluded from this count are birds observed at nests or with chicks. These adults do not get counted as additional breeding adults as they are counted elsewhere as part of a solitary nest visit or with the roving chick observation. Breeding adults from other routes or rooftops are also not counted as additional adults. Sometimes breeding birds that are nesting but not on the route you are surveying will come and visit your route. They do not get counted as additional adults because they will be counted on their own route or rooftop where they are actually breeding. Behavior should give these birds away. They will be single birds or, in, or pairs of birds loafing or foraging along a route, but not displaying nesting behavior. They will likely be observed at different locations on the route, either on the same survey or on subsequent surveys. Third, non-breeding birds are also not counted as additional adults. These include birds that are too young to breed and breeding aged adults that are not breeding during the survey, such as migrants, birds that lack a mate or weren't able to establish a territory. These birds may be alone or in small flocks and are not defending territories or exhibiting other nesting behavior. Birds that are known or are likely non-breeders should not be counted as additional breeding adults on your route because they are not actively breeding during the season. 
Note that for some species, plumage is not a reliable indicator that a bird is breeding. For example, American oyster catchers do not breed until they are three or five years old, but can have full adult plumage before then. Behavior is going to be the best indicator that a bird is breeding. Sometimes you may find it challenging to determine if a bird should be counted as additional breeding adult on your route. If you are unsure, ask yourselves a few questions about the birds. One, are they either by themselves or paired off with a potential mate? Two, have you been regularly seeing these birds in the same location on your route? Three, are they present on route during peak nesting season? And that will differ uh, for each of the three species, but for the most part, that's going to be March through June. And four, are they exhibiting breeding behaviors, like actively detending, defending territory, but you have not found a nest for them? If you can answer yes to these questions or most of these questions, then these birds are likely nesting on your route and can be counted as additional breeding adults. Learning to identify additional breeding adults on your route takes time and patience. If you are brand new to surveying, it is helpful to shadow a more experienced shorebird monitor. Remember to reach out to your local partnership for guidance and resources. Let's continue using our example survey from earlier. This route is called Amelia Island and was surveyed by Ima and Elizabeth on March 18th during the first monthly count window from 9 to 11 a.m. These observers surveyed the route by walking and were able to complete an entire route survey, meaning they covered the route from start to end point. They used tallies to keep track of additional breeding adults that they saw on route for a total of three oyster catchers zero snowy plovers, and eight Wilson's plovers. Amelia Island is a, on the Atlantic coast, so snowy plovers do not breed there, so they will always report zero breeding adults for snowy plovers when they survey this route. If you are actively looking for additional breeding adults during your route survey, but do not see any, please record zero. Absent data is important too. Let us know, it lets us know with certainty what areas the birds are not using for nesting. Step two is to document any nesting adults, chicks, or young observed on the route survey using the shorebird nest form, the colony form, and the roving chick staging young form. Let's start with shorebirds. So this is on page seven and eight in the protocol if you're following along. Shorebirds nest individually, so each shorebird nest is considered its own site and gets its own shorebird nest form pictured here. You will use the same data sheet to document a new site and to document a site visit. Each time you find a new shorebird nest, you'll need to give that nest a unique name, report if it is a re-nest. Uh, so when a breeding bird, a breeding pair, sorry, when a breeding pair has previously previously attempted to nest during the current breeding season, then initiates another nest, that second nest is considered a re-nest. The first nest a breeding pair has is often referred to as the original nest. You will also need to take a GPS point for the location of the nest that you found. A nearby point is okay. It's important to avoid flushing the birds from the nest. If you're worried about finding the site again, use the comment section to note some landmarks or your position relative to the nest. Here's an example of a shorebird nest form documenting a newly found nest. The nest was given a unique name. I recommend using a naming convention that conveys key information about the site. For instance, start with the location, so AI for Amelia Island, the name of the route, then the species code, Whipple for Wilson's Plover, and then the nest number. In this example, the new nest is also a re-nest, re so that is indicated in the name as well. The original nest for this pair was AI Whipple 01, so the pair's first re-nest is named AI Whipple 01 R1, R1 for re-nest 1. Because this is a re-nest, check off yes and report the name of the original nest. 
then record GPS coordinates and note if the site is posted. Remember to always alert land managers about new sites, especially if they are not in posted areas. After documenting the new nest site, we will need to complete a site visit. You will do a site visit for any shorebird nest sites seen during a route survey. Each time you conduct a site visit, you'll record the status of the nest and the final outcome of the nest if it has already ended, the species, the nesting behavior exhibited by the adults, if one or both of the adults are present at the nest, as well as any egg and nestling counts if those are visible. And lastly, any relevant comments such as if the adults are banded or doing any unusual behavior. You can also report potential threats and disturbances in the optional information section. The shorebird nest form has three status categories, probable nesting, active, and no longer active. Probable nesting is for cases where you strongly suspect that there is a nest nearby, but you don't want to disturb the birds to investigate. If you survey weekly or daily, and you think you might eventually spot the nest, I advise waiting until you see the nest to add the site to the database. But if you go out once a month or every couple of weeks or the habitat makes it unlikely that you will ever see the nest, add it as a potential nest site. Active means you saw the nest with viable eggs or nestlings, saw an adult bird incubating or brooding, or saw one of the adults perform broken wing display or a similar display to draw you away from the area. No longer active is when the nest has ended and is no longer tended to by the adults. No viable eggs are, or chicks are left in the nest cup. This could be because either the eggs have hatched and chicks have left the nest, the nest was abandoned or destroyed, or the nest is gone and there's not enough evidence to tell what has happened. Detecting solitary shorebird nests is often best done by first watching a shorebird's behavior. If you see a bird incubating, brooding nestlings, or giving the broken wing display, it means a nest is present. Some birds are more cryptic. They may slink away from the nest to lure you away from the area. All three of these behaviors can be reported as an active nest site. Pictured on the top of this slide is an example of an American oyster catcher incubating eggs. Middle is a picture of a snowy plover rooting nestlings still inside the nest cup. And pictured bottom is a Wilson's plover performing a broken wing display. Also of note, don't confuse a bird rooting nestlings with a brood with a bird rooting roving chicks. When an adult is brooding nestlings, they are at the nest site, and it's likely that one or more of the eggs are still hatching. When an adult is brooding roving chicks, they are not at a nest site and are documented using the roving chick staging young form. In our example, shorebird nest form here, a breeding pair of Wilson's plovers were observed acting like they had a nest, but the nest itself was not visually confirmed. The adults were slinking down the beach, trying to draw attention away from the area where AI Whipple 01R1 was found. This behavior is a good indicator that there is a nest nearby. Thus, the nest status is reported as probable nesting on the data sheet. In the count section, record the number and species to Whipple adults. The egg and nestling counts are left blank as no nest was observed. Another example where you would report the nest status as probable nesting is if a pair is in a large closed area. Typically, that would be a posted colony where you are unable to get a good enough view to see a nest or enter that area, but the parental behavior strongly suggests a nest is present. Let's say the same nest that we just talked about is checked on a week later. This time, the same pair is seen in the same area and one of the adults is in incubating posture. 
After a few minutes, the incubating adult gets off the nest, revealing three eggs and zero nestlings. Record the nest status as active, the nesting behavior as incubating, and the count of eggs as three, nestlings as zero, and adults as two. If the nest is active, but you are unsure if eggs or nestlings are present, as you cannot see into the nest cup, you re can report unknown for both. If you know eggs or nestlings are in the nest cup but did not count them, you can report them as present. We want, we want you to give us as much information as you can gather from a distance that is safe for you and the birds. It is okay to not collect some data if collecting it will disturb the birds. Let's say the same nest is again checked for a third time a few days later. This time, no adults are in the area and there are no eggs in the nest. It's too soon for the eggs to have hatched and there are ghost crab tracks in and around the nest as well as a crab burrow next to the nest. In this instance, you would record the nest status as no longer active, the final outcome as no eggs hatched, and document the evidence that crabs likely predated the nest. Once a nest is given a final outcome, you no longer need to visit that site when conducting future route surveys. If the adults from this nest try to nest again, that new nest will be considered a renest and a new nest site. Shorebird chicks are highly mobile and, as we mentioned before, can travel many miles from their natal nest shortly after hatching. Any shorebird chicks observed outside of the nest are considered roving chicks and are documented using the roving chick staging young form. It is not common, but sometimes you may observe shorebird chicks that are still in the nest. These chicks are considered nestlings and are reported on the shorebird nest form. Here's an example of how to report a nestling on the shorebird nest form. In this example, one egg and one nestling were observed in the nest cup with both, both adults nearby. The site status is marked as active and the count table includes one nestling found in the nest with one egg. Again, this is not a common occurrence, but you may see it. If you find a shorebird roving chick, you will report it using a roving chick staging young form. You will need to document the location of the chick or chicks, the habitat type they are using, the species, the number of adults and chicks, the natal nest if known, as well as any other relevant comments, such as the birds were banded or if there's any interesting interactions. Again, like all the other forms, there is an optional section to document any potential threats or disturbances. Both roving chicks and staging young are reported by chick age classes, downy, feathered, and flight capable. You can read more about these birds on page 14 in the protocol. A downy chick, like the one pictured on the top of the slide, includes chicks from newly hatched up to one and a half or two weeks old, depending on the species and local variability. They are covered in downy feathers and look very fuzzy. They're small and will stay close to the parents. In the case of shorebird chicks, when recently hatched chicks are found in the nest bowl, they are again reported as nestlings. And as soon as that downy chick leaves the nest bowl, they are reported as a roving downy chick. Feathered chicks, like the one pictured in the middle of this slide, are about one and a half to three weeks old and have pin feathers. Feathered chicks may have some down, but overall more feathers than down. They're bigger and more mobile and have a scruffy appearance. And you'll notice that they are significantly smaller than adults. Flight capable chicks, like the one pictured on the bottom of this side, are flight capable. Uh, they're about three to four weeks old and have learned to fly and are capable of flying in short bursts. As soon as they're able to do this, we count them as flight capable. These chicks are almost the same size as an adult at this point, and depending on the species, they may have very similar plumage. Here's an example of a roving chick staging young form. There were three downy Wilson's plover chicks observed foraging on the beach with one adult. 
These observers recorded the species as Whipple, three downy chicks, zero feathered and zero flight capable chicks. They also recorded one adult and that the beach was the habitat type. In this case, the natal nest for these chicks is known, uh, AI Whipple 01. A natal nest is the nest from which the chicks hatched. You can only assign natal nests for shorebirds. Um, we ask that you give us the natal nest name whenever possible and encourage you to assign a natal nest if you know the happenings of your route and are relatively confident. This route is surveyed weekly and the observers know that even though there are multiple Wilson's plover pairs nesting in this area, AI Whipple 01 is the only nest that was near its hatch date. If you are able, please fill out the optional, optional information section at the bottom of the form. All the sites, all the site forms have this section and filling it out, out can help guide management and document pressures that birds are experiencing. In this particular example, there were dogs on the beach and wet rack present. We will come back to talking about staging young, but first let's discuss colonies. You will fill out the seabird colony form anytime you survey a colony. Seabirds nest collectively in colonies that can be comprised of one or more species nesting together. And you can look at colony information in the protocol on pages 9 and 10. We will use the same data sheet to document a new colony site and a colony site visit. When you observe a new colony, you'll need to one, give the colony a unique name, and two, collect location data. Colonies cover an area, so unlike solitary nests that only have one point, you will need to collect multiple coordinates for colonies, at least three. Colonies may shift or grow or shrink in size over the breeding season, and if that happens, you may need to collect new GPS coordinates to reflect those changes. In this example, a new mixed species colony was found on a route survey for Amelia Island. The colony needs a unique name. Again, I recommend naming colony sites like we did solitary nest sites by using a naming convention that conveys key information about the site. For example, start with the location, in this case, AI again, for the name of the route, Amelia Island. Then the species code, since it's it's comprised of two species. I called it a mixed colony. And then the colony number. This is the first colony found on this route. So the colony is given the name AI Mixed Colony 01. The colony may grow or shift over time. So even though you will record three GPS points for the location of the colony when you first discover it, you may need to update those coordinates again later. Just like solitary nest sites, it's important to alert landowners and managers to new colonies, especially if they are not yet posted. After documenting the new colony site, we'll need to complete a site visit. You'll do a site visit for any seabird colony sites seen during a route survey. When conducting a site visit to a colony, you'll need to record the status of the colony, if the colony is no longer active, you will also need to report a final outcome. Counts of nest chicks and adults present in the colony. Major loss, if there is any, if the site is posted. And again, I always encourage everybody to record comments. You can use the space to document any additional information such as banded birds or a disturbance event. Again, there is that optional information section for recording disturbances, uh, but you can also use the comment section to further explain what happened. The seabird colony form has two status categories, active and no longer active, which are very similar to nest statuses for solitary nests. Active means that you either saw at least one bird in the colony incubating a nest or brooding chicks. It's unlikely that you'll actually be able to see the eggs. Uh, you're not gonna be able to get very close because colonies are posted areas and you don't want the birds to be reacting to your presence. So you're normally gonna be looking for adult birds that are in incubating or brooding posture. Active can also 
a colony can also be considered active if at least one chick of any age class is present in that colony. The no longer active status is used when the colony has ended and there are no longer any nests or chicks left in that colony. A colony's final outcome will report if the colony was successful, so meaning at least one flight capable chick was produced from the colony, or if the colony was abandoned or destroyed before producing any flight capable young, or if the colony is gone and you're not really sure what happened. When conducting a seabird colony survey, you will be conducting counts of all nests, chicks, and adults in or very near the colony. As mentioned earlier, you are unlikely to be able to see nests with eggs in them in a colony. So nests are counted by proxy by counting the number of adults in incubating posture. It is important that while counting colonies, you stay back a safe distance from the birds. You should be far enough away from the colony that birds are not flushing or moving in response to your presence. When counting seabirds, we ask you to report the count type because it lets us know how you counted the birds, which gives us a sense of the accuracy for those numbers. There are four different count types for colonies, direct, extrapolated, presence, absence, and did not check. Count types are defined on pages 11 through 13 of the breeding bird protocol. Different survey conditions will dictate which count type you use. Whenever possible, you should, you should conduct a direct count. Use when you're able to see and count everything in the colony, all nests, chicks, and adults, and the number you're reporting is the true actual number. You may need to move around to count the entire colony. Start with nests and count all nests by counting incubating adults and count them at least twice and report the average of your counts as the direct count of nests. For larger colonies, it is good to have help. If you're counting a colony with other surveyors, each surveyor can count one time and then report the average of everyone's count as the direct count. And then you'll repeat this for chicks and total adults. In this example, I visited a colony and I was able to see and count the entire colony. On my first count of nests, I counted 50 and on my second, I got 52. So I report the average of these counts as my direct count for this colony. So it'd be 51 nests. If you are unable to conduct a direct count, try to conduct an extrapolated count. This is a less accurate count, but still provides really good information on the size of the colony. Extrapolated counts are used when your view of a colony is significantly obstructed. This may be due to vegetation or topography like dunes, and no matter where you move, you cannot get a view of the entire colony. You may also use this count when the colony is really large and you're running short on time and you do not have the time to conduct a direct count for the entire colony. This could be because a thunderstorm is rolling in and it's gonna interrupt your survey. An extrapolated count is not a guess. It is a calculation based on the proportion of the colony where you can conduct a direct count. So let's walk through an example. The example colony pictured here has a huge dune running through it. It is not feasible to conduct a direct count because no vantage point or combination of vantage points allow you to view and count the entire colony. So instead you conduct an extrapolated count using the calculation protocol found in the breeding bird protocol. Step one, position yourself where you can see as much of the colony as possible. Step two, Delineate the viewable portion of the colony as your count area. In this example, you can see the portion of the colony shaded in light green, so that larger area. You cannot see the portion of the colony shaded in dark green, that smaller section that's blocked by the dune. You conduct a direct count of the nest in the viewable portion of the colony. Remember, a direct count is the average of two counts. So in this example, your direct count of nests in the viewable portion is 450. Step three, you determine approximately what percent of the entire colony your direct count area covers. Here, you approximate that you counted 75% of the entire colony. 
Step four, now you divide your direct count by the portion of the colony counted to get your extrapolated count. In this example, you divide 450 by 75% for a total of 600 nests. If you run into uh, decimal values when doing this calculation, round to the nearest whole number. If you don't have time for direct or extrapolated counts, you can report presence or absence. The count types at least let us know whether a colony is active in the area. It has limited utility for us, but at least lets us and other monitors on the route know if there are nests and for what species in the colony. If you use presence in lieu of a count, know that presence equals one. When we do any analysis, we are only able to say with any certainty that there was at least one. If you are time limited, please consider doing an extrapolated count, especially when counting adults. Marking absent indicates that you are able to verify that there were zero nests or chicks in the colony. It is the same as reporting a direct count of zero. If you can't confirm presence or absence, for example, after a storm and you suspect chicks may be present but are hiding, report back did not check. There are additional count types used to monitor rooftops described in the Breeding Bird Protocol and in the rooftop training webinar, which will be held this Friday, March 15th from 1 to 2.30. Let's go back to fill out the seabird colony form for the newly found AI Mix Colony 01. The site visit portion of the form looks and is similar to what we filled out on the shorebird nest form. This colony is mixed and has black skimmers and least turns nesting in it. I observe adults from both species in incubating posture, so I report the colony status as active. I report no for major loss, since this is the first time I have observed this colony. Major loss is used to report when 25% or more of the colony is lost, either a large number of chicks disappeared or nests failed between visits. A common cause for major loss is weather events that cause overwash or predation. I can see the entire colony here, so nothing obstructs my view, and I'm going to use a direct count to document nests, chicks, and adults. I report a direct count of 32 adults in incubating posture for black skimmers. There are no chicks yet, so I report a direct count of zero for all age classes. When I count adults, I count the total number of adults in the colony, including adults in incubating posture. Because of this, your adult count should almost always be greater than your nest count. I repeat this for the least turn counts and get a direct count of eight nests, zero chicks for all age classes, and 24 adults. Let's talk about seabird chicks. As mentioned previously, seabird chicks are different from shorebird chicks in that they stay in or near the colony weeks after hatching. If seabird chicks are within sight of an active colony, they should be counted as part of the active colony on the seabird colony form. Seabird chicks of any age class can be documented as part of the seabird colony form. If you observe flight capable young and do not see the colony from where you are, count them as on the roving chick staging young form. This is the same form as the one we already went over for shorebird roving chicks. You can only report flight capable seabird chicks on this form. You cannot report downy or feathered chicks for seabirds. Chicks this young should still be within a colony. Here's an example of a seabird colony with fledging still within sight of the colony. This colony was observed late in the season and adults and flight cable chicks are still there, so this colony is considered active. The counts are marked in the relevant columns, and as soon as all those flight capable chicks have left the colony, this colony will be considered no longer active with a final outcome of one or more flight capable chicks were produced. If a group, if a group of flight capable young and adults are observed away from a colony, then use the roving chick staging young form. This is the same form we used when documenting roving chicks. Let's look at an example of documenting least turn young. A flock of flight capable young 
least turns are not within sight of any colony. I take a GPS location, remembering not to get too close to disturb them, and record if the area is posted. I report the species and the total number of flight-capable young and adults present with these young. As I was recording these counts, an off-leash dog runs toward them, causing them to flush. I record this in the optional information section. If you see banded birds on your survey, please document and report these observations. Remember to record the species of the bird, the color and position of any birds and flags, if there are codes on any of the bands or flags, an approximate GPS location, date and time of the observation, and if possible, get a photograph. Visit the FSA's banded bird page to learn where to report banded birds. You can report bands to, who you report bands to varies by species and band combination. The banded bird page can be found by going to the FSA's website and clicking on the banded bird link under the resources tab. You can also find guidance on how to collect and record band information. We do not currently have dedicated fields in the FSD to report banded birds, but you can include this information in the comments. The final step of monitoring shorebirds, step three, is entering your data online into the Florida Shorebird Database at flshorebirddatabase.org. We only have a limited amount of time to walk you through the basic steps, but you can contact us anytime during the season and with any questions, and we would be more than happy to help guide you through data entry. The first step in entering data is to create your own Florida Shorebird Database account if you do not already have one. Anytime you're using the FSD, it's best to use Google Chrome as your browser. If you can't remember your login information, are having issues logging in, don't have Google Chrome, or run into any other issues with the database, please feel free to email us with any questions to flshorebirddatabase at myfwc.com. After you log into your account, you will be asked who you're entering data for. This will almost always be yourself, so click on the Set for Myself button. You will only use the Select Another User button if you are entering data on behalf of someone else. A guide for entering data for others can be found by clicking on that Quick Guide link. After setting data entry for yourself, you'll be brought to this page. This is your My Data page where you will be able to see all the routes, breeding sites, and rooftops that you monitor listed here. If you are brand new to the FSD, these boxes will all be empty. All the data forms we went over today are entered in the database when you enter a route survey. So in order to enter a route survey, you first need to populate that box with routes. Remember, lots of routes already exist in the database and multiple people could be surveying the same route. If you want to add a route to your profile, first click, first check to see whether it already exists in the database by clicking on the blue Add Routes button. You can search for a route either by FWC region or county. Routes will appear in a list and on the map. Select the route or routes you want to add to your profile by checking the checkbox next to the route name. Then click Add to My Routes. The selected route or routes will now appear on your profile on the My Breeding Data page. If you are absolutely certain the route you survey doesn't already exist, you can create a new route in the database. To do this, click on the Create New Route button at the bottom of the page. This will bring you to the Establish a New Route page. You can create a new route by drawing the route on the map using the capture click method or by entering a series of coordinates. Be sure to zoom into the map and make sure your new route adequately represents the area that you are surveying. If you only enter the start and end points over your route, you may end up with routes that look like this, where the start and end points are on a great location on the beach but most of that middle section of your route that you're surveying appears in the ocean because the beach curves inland a little. So this route as it looks right now does not adequately reflect the area you are surveying. Instead, you're gonna to wanna to go in and add a few more points so that the route matches the area you are surveying. 
Sometimes the map itself is a little out of date, especially after storms have gone through and the landscape has changed. So be mindful of that as well. Once your route is drawn, give it a unique name and provide descriptive details, how to best access your route, where to park, where to start and end your survey, and then click submit and your new route will display in your My Routes box. Now you're ready to enter your route survey data. Click on the add survey button next to the route you want to enter a survey for. This will bring you to the report route survey page, which is equivalent to the route form we talked about. Enter the data you collected with the route form here. You will notice that the route name and observer one are automatically filled out for you. To add other observers who have FSD accounts, click on the button with the three dots next to observer two. In the pop-up box, either enter the first or last name of your other observers, hit search user, then hit select next to the desired person's name. Now their name will appear as observer two, or if you were doing that through the observer three box, it will appear there. Use the additional observers box right below to enter information about people who participated in the survey, but do not have FSD accounts. Or if there are more than three people who participated in data collection, you can also use that, those boxes for that as well. In this example, Elizabeth helped Megan and I with this survey, but she does not have an FSD account, so I recorded her name in the names box and report one in the number of additional observers box. Then you're going to continue on to fill out the date, the start and end times using local time, survey coverage, what mode of transportation was used to survey, and any comments that were recorded during the survey. Once you've completed step one, the route form, you'll click on the continue to step two button. Step two is where you enter information from the shorebird nest form, the seabird colony form, and the roving chick staging young form. Use the add sites to route button to enter any new sites. Then click on the enter visit button next to each site to enter the site visit information. Click on the enter roving chick slash staging young button to enter any chick or young observations. After entering all your site visits, roving chick observations, and staging young observations, remember to enter any additional breeding adults that you observed on route. Click on the field and enter a numeric count. Or if you looked but not, could not see any additional breeding adults, please report zero. Remember, zero is confirmed absence. And if you are unable to look for additional breeding adults, so not able to confirm whether birds were there or not, click on the drop down menu to select did not count. Remember, did not count and zero are not interchangeable. They mean two different things. After all your data has been entered, be sure to review your route survey to make sure all information has been entered correctly and is free of typos. If you need to edit any of the site visit information you entered, you can click the edit button next to the site visit that needs editing. When you are finished entering and reviewing your data, scroll to the bottom of the page and click the Submit Route Survey button. If something comes up and you cannot finish entering your route survey, you can click on the Save and Finish Later button. The next time you log in, the FSD will prompt you to finish data entry. If you want to view your route surveys, see the surveys that other participants have entered for a route, or need to update any information on route surveys you've already entered, you can click on the View Edit buttons in the My Routes box. So to sum up, there are four main steps to entering data in the FSD. You're going to sign into your FSD account, check for existing routes, and if your route that you're surveying is not there, then you can go ahead and create it. You're going to enter your route survey, and then you're going to view or edit your surveys as needed. The breeding bird protocol, the data forms we discussed, any quick guides, webinar recordings, and a bunch of other helpful training videos are available on the resource tab of the FSD website. Keep in mind that the 2024 webinar recordings will not 
be available immediately, but you can find the 2023 webinar recordings until then. Also check out the FL Shorebird Alliance website for additional resources about bird identification, chick age guides, the monthly Rackline newsletter, and so much more. And you can always contact us anytime with questions about the protocol or data entry or any of the resources at flshorebirddatabase at myfwc.com. Thank you all so much for attending this webinar and for continuing to make the Florida Shorebird Monitoring Program a success. Thank you all again, and I hope you have a great season. Let me know if you guys have any questions.